But the tables, and I am here on the first row when the flight lieutenant steps out before us and he acknowledges something that was troubling my mind earlier when he asks, who wants to fight the aliens? For this I realize it's why this Christmas is like the others. Welcome back to the Daniel's Nemesis podcast, reading chapters 12, 13, and 14. Today is a bumper free chapter edition from that show with podcast in the title. Value for your money. Well, three chapters, but they're all short. So it's like those family packs of cereals. And it also depends on what you mean by value. Anywho, three chapters from what, I hear you ask. Have you ever spent hours on something on which you have no idea what you're doing? Maybe it's whittling wood. You start whittling away with a vague idea of what shape you want. As you go further, ideas for details start forming and you go about creating the vision that is becoming clear in your head. Sure, mistakes happen, but you work around that with your imagination adjusting for the catastrophes that have occurred. After many hours, your work is finished. And what you have left is a lump of wood with holes and dangerous splinters. My book, my novel, X-Book. What started as a simple idea of aliens invading the Earth right after the First World War was whittled into what I present to you in this podcast. I then dissect the meaning of what I wrote over 15 years ago from the perspective of the blue of the walls separates from its vertical prison, flying towards my eyes. To stop the colour piercing into my retinas, I shut my eyes, but the blue moves around, whispering to me. Oh, he's talking again! This is supposed to be a solo podcast, but I have started to be joined by figures from my past relevant to this novel. There's not much I can do, so I've just accepted it now. Anyway, as we prepare to leave the first act, where are we up to so far? Having spent 850 years travelling from one dying planet to Earth, it's William's role to get the Trascons onto Earth. He has given warning of an impending attack. He then stared at a light bulb for a while. Ginger human fighter pilot, called off his Christmas leave to lead his squadron, has had to convince his squad that the aliens are real. Remember, this is fiction, always fiction. Logic is as logic does. Chapter 12. A good night story from William. It's the end of my working day, which comes as a relief. It's exhausting having to sit down all day, looking at screens, checking air supplies, food supplies, water supplies, charts, star maps, trajectories, speed meters, all of which, when designed for a journey that will take a millennia, hardly change over the course of a day or two. How often do I pray for that comet to come, for a bit of excitement? to start my day with. That's the majority of my day, anyhow. Then there's all the politics. Years of flying through space have created cabin fever. Politics is now a religion. Factions have been created within the ship. People, all with different ideas, fighting against beliefs, fighting for beliefs. Fighting for equality against the knowledge. Then, there is the role that is placed upon each new member of a family, concerning the role of that final family member when the time comes. People believe that you should choose which part to play in the takeover, not what is put upon you. Others believe that the knowledge is all-powerful and should not be ignored. 
the fighting, the destruction, the wars fought within such a confined space. Much of it before my time, but we are here now. Tensions are at an all-time high. Expectations placed upon me as the chosen one to lead them through it all. I had a dream last night. It was such a simple dream, but one of those that I long for. Holly came round. We were playing our musical instruments together. We both play the same stringed instrument. It was the first time we ever met. Conversation was stilted, but no more so than usual between two relative strangers. She had only come round because I had invited her. Conversation seemed of the least importance. We were playing together, harmonizing, improvising, but what I was playing sounded wrong. Eventually, I managed to get the settings right on my pedal, what I call the Godspeed settings, and then everything I was playing made sense. She looked at me and with a smile said, That's nice. Simple. But it's the only time I can ever think of that anyone has ever really spoken to me in a dream with such sincerity and clarity. Certainly the only time where I've been able to remember what was said after waking. It warms my heart to think about it. Soon we gave up and she started telling me about the TX-82 sampler she had. Very rare, difficult to get hold of, but she wanted another one. I promised her that I would do anything I could to get hold of one for her. That's when I woke. I would like to think that Holly existed, but she is out there somewhere waiting for me. But I know that this is simply not the truth, though so often I kid myself that it is. She does not exist. She is an embodiment of... of... of my ideal of true love. That she comes to me in my dreams and makes me want to be with her forever. But there is a catch in the clause. By embodying my image of true love, I can love only her. Because, well, what are the chances of me ever meeting anyone exactly like this? I begin to wonder if that's why she rejects me in my dreams. She pushes me away so that I will have to go out and find someone else. But, Holly, it doesn't work. I want. Only you. I sit down to watch the vision monitor, similar to Earth cinema but accessible at home. There does not seem to be anything worth watching. I call through to the station and request a program. Five minutes later, it is on. No doubt there will be countless complaints at the station for changing the lineup last minute but at least they will be alive to answer the complaints. It's this bowing down culture. It allows me to abuse the systems. Eventually I go to bed. Tomorrow will be a big day. Strategies will need to be formulated, plans undertaken. It's naive to think that they will surrender unconditionally. They will put up a fight. There has just been a massive war on that planet. No doubt, many are still bloodthirsty, still wanting to wreak their revenge on something for the millions that died, the friends and family lost. There are many proud countries, always willing to show their strength, to combat whatever humiliations they feel they suffered in the past. Also, we represent a major risk to their world. We are a major risk. We can never strike a compromise. They will need to be destroyed. But we must be able to leave ourselves in a position where many of their buildings and supplies are unharmed to allow us to take over. Not all humans will die, but enough to ensure that we can never lose control. 
enough to ensure that they can never pose a threat to ourselves. But how stubborn will they be is the only question that can't be answered yet. If necessary, certain cities will need to be eliminated to reduce the power across the world. We cannot be weak. Chapter 13 Ginger Parties For I think it may be Christmas Eve. That is a reason that seems fitting to me. Sat here, in the mess hall, with many others, and we are having turkey. Some part of me looks around in a daze, not being able to absorb the colours, the brightness, the noise and merriment coming from the mass of men. Some part of me cannot take this in, looking at the men in their gaiety, whereas I seem cut off. Am I happy right now? I cannot be sure. Am I enjoying myself? There certainly seems to be no hard feelings right now. Is that enough? But another part of me looks around and cannot accept the fact that there is some magnificence to this day that seems unlike any other. Why? There have been many other December 24ths, but this one seems different from those that seem to remain in my memory. There is something there, but I can only remember the last three or four. This part of my brain seems locked on the fact that it should be different, this day, from the others. There is no need for it to be like the others, and that it is time for goodwill. Yet, for some reason, it is not. It hasn't ended yet, and it seems like it never will, not now. There was, perhaps, a time when people need fear not the next day. But people seem to forget this. Maybe they always have. Do people not understand? Can they not see? We have not changed. We have not been allowed to change. There is something that should mark this day away from others. Yet, I cannot see it. Instead, I turn my worries to my turkey. Then why are the tables different? They are lined up, facing one wall. They face this direction as if something great should happen. But it does not. You, Holly, are here with me. But there is something, for you follow the dark angel with the white cross. You are the white angel, and you carry a dark cross. And here you parade, making your grand statement, which is lost on me. And yet, though you look right, as you should be in your garments, you are not like the dark angel, for she is happy. No. You are sad. But why? Can I help? Instead you leave, like you always do, long before your welcome has worn itself out. But uh, the tables! And I am here, on the first row, when the flight lieutenant steps out before us. And he acknowledges something that was troubling my mind earlier, when he asks, Who wants to fight the aliens? For this, I realize, is why this Christmas is like the others. No freedom, as was hoped for. But freedom from what? The world around us? The things happening around us? That should not make a Christmas troubling. And yet it does. But the flight lieutenant's words arouse something within many of the men in this room and a great chorus of hands go up to much stamping of feet and cheers. Cheers from the men. There are shouts also, but I am only capable of picking up one shout, along the lines of how they would fuck their mothers also. I do not put my hand up, nor do you. There was something before all this. Something before the life I can remember, but I am not sure what. You, Holly, you shrug your shoulders at me with as much incomprehension as I have. There was my birth, my realization, the realization that tears were pouring down my face, the gulping in of air 
And as I do this, slowly it dawns on me that the side of my head aches. Aches. That there is blood running down the side of it. My birth and the dawn of my knowledge. But there was no life before that. And this happened about four years ago. But the flight lieutenant singles me out, as he does so often. And I feel pressure when he asks me, Why not? As I am taken aback, my mind scrabbles for an answer. But all I can see is nothing before I trip out my words. Because there is something not quite right about it. My mouth trembling and my body shaking. I can only stare down at the table whilst knowing that I should have said, It is not right. And slowly, now, the answers start forming in my head. I glance up and I catch the tail end of the flight lieutenant's sneer. The men are breaking into a song, an old war song, but the words are subtly changed. There are more lines about fucking people's mothers. This would not bother me if it wasn't for the fact that the whole of history has evidence to support their claims. A revulsion runs through my body, but it makes me more afraid than repulsed, more like a stirring of the stomach and just sad thoughts to go with it. Now, knowing answers, I want to tell people and I raise my hand into the air. It stiffens, physically stiffens, as if cast in iron and my will desires it to grow. It feels like it can only go upwards and is stretching, yet it is not. A small voice emits from my mouth asking for quiet. It repeats stronger, stronger, and it turns into a scream, a violent yell for recognition. But still, they sing their song, not interested in any other desires than their own. Defeated, I retreat back down into my seat, and I want to be small. But I can't be, as my thought ever so slowly crystallizes, empowers me. I do not want war. This is a thought that should have been on my mind four years ago, after I entered into this world, but it only now comes to my mind. It almost makes me dizzy to think about it. There is a cloud that tries to cover it, a desire to push it away, but the power of clear thinking finally finds its force. And I sit back, and I reflect over the implications of this. I do not want war. You squeeze my hand tight. So did I ever? No, but that was my life. It was the only thing I could accept, had to accept, even though I did not feel it was real, just a construct of my imagination. So why can't war be my life now? Because I know that I am not the only person who does not want this war. But I must wait until tomorrow now. Holly, come with me now. Chapter 14. William Dreams. I stand here and looking up above me, I can see space. But when I look down, there is the cold, dark ground. Perhaps for the first time in my life, I am actually able to look up to the sky instead of being surrounded by it. And although I can't see much, I feel like I can really breathe. But as to whether or not I feel like I'm supposed to be here is another matter a much more confused matter. I don't want to look around me because I am scared that there won't be much now to look at. I only want to look upwards at the sky from which I came. I fear to look around because 
I'm worried that where there should have been a world, there no longer is. Maybe this is why I feel that I should not be here. Then, what have I done? When I decide to look around me, I notice that you, Holly, are standing there, but with your back to me. You are looking out at the distant expanse in front of you that surrounds us both. I try to move towards you, but I feel that you don't notice me. When I try to move in front of you, to force you to notice me, you keep your back towards me. But I do not believe that you do this intentionally. I move away to keep my distance. Maybe soon you will turn around to me. You don't. Part of me wants to stay here for this, to make sure that you are around. Another part of me wants to walk as far away as I possibly can. Regardless, either of these scenarios do not, will not take away from the fact that right now, what I feel I need to do is damage to myself. An urge like never that I have had before. To fall to my knees and smash my head into the ground. It is thoughts like these that consume me now. You are there, Holly, with your back to me. And all around us is the empty space of my own making. What else am I supposed to feel? General notes. So I really have no idea what's happened. I listen back as I'm about to post this and well, the whole podcast has been taken over and look, I've been so busy recently. I've just been overwhelmed with work and I don't have the time to re-record all of this. So I'm just going to put it up as is. It's not listenable. You can probably hear in my voice throughout the whole episode just how tired I am. Anyway, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say what happens next week. Ginger flies a plane and has an encounter with himself. So if you don't listen to this, that's fine. Thank you. Bye. Today's been a more somber episode as the reality starts hitting in with both characters, both dealing with their pre-gig nerves in different ways. Ginger was stuck in his head as the world goes on around him, and William, which I am in, but I am here outside of it, watching myself, wondering who this person is that is me. I am trapped in a somewhere but I don't don't know know where. where. I see see myself myself in a world, world, but I know, but I can't can't be there. there. I am here with myself and I can't can't move away. I have to be there. I can't be here, despite that. I do attempt to bring in some joy with the party that Ginger cannot involve himself in. It's really nice to see Ginger around other people. especially his peers, as we've seen the last couple of episodes. It brings out his isolation and distance from others. Whereas in the previous Ginger episode, he was struggling to bring others into his knowledge, now he is unable, unwilling to bring himself into the world around him. Apparently, I'm getting good at contrasting pairs of chapters in a way that... I'm not sure how long I've been here. All I know is that I am real now. Real. But wasn't I always real? Then, why am I real now when... And I've been casting my mind back, trying to remember the original reason for this. Well, this book started as a rip-off of Independence Day. So, of course, there was going to be a Bill Pullman moment. It just so happens that Ginger is there to undermine the performance. Well, not really. It seems very much like all the men are in their own world. Ginger just tunes into it as he will. What awareness of myself do I have right now? 
I know of my body, it's something that I can't separate myself from. But my body feels distant, as if it's a phantom. It does what I want it to do, but it's not right. I am not imagining my body. But it just feels like it's somewhere, something that Blake Snyder talks about. And yeah, I'm bringing up Blake Snyder again. We've talked before about the debate period. Ginger's had his little debate with his squadron, but now he is really ramping up his values. He is going full pacifist. Ginger is choosing his values. But he hasn't found a way out of the circle. I feel as if I am living in two different places at the same time. Right now, I am here. But right now, I am there. There is where my squadron are. Here is where the doppelgangers are. I am both in the mess hall and surrounded by blue walls. What we have here is an origin story. Ginger's equivalent, anyway. We've only seen him fully formed in terms of his response to the trauma of the war. And Ginger, like William, is starting to look backwards. But it seems that he can only go so far. Who was he before the war? It's something that we don't know as Ginger himself doesn't know. But it's another question that's been shoved right in front of us. No one else is aware of me. Everyone is so self-absorbed. I know that I exist. It's all that I've ever known, and that is what matters. But now, the mess hall disappears and is being replaced with all sorts in overdoing it with William's anti-involvement in the story. In previous episodes, he's been sat there, on the floor, looking at a light bulb. Now, he's going to bed, and just full-on sleeping. I clearly had an issue with self-indulgence, what is good for the story, and where to explore outside of pure narrative function to stop things being, and here I am. This isn't my place. In a strange way, the Blue Walls is my place. I just don't know how. But this new world, for it doesn't feel like anything like Earth, this is not a place I should be. It's wrong for me to be where I am right now. But William talks about the Godspeed settings. This is a direct reference to Godspeed, you Black Emperor, who have just released a new album as I record this. Music was important to the writing of this book. I always had music on in the background. I was all over the place with post-rock and Britpop, a smidge of techno and ambient trance music. But I think it was post-rock, particularly Godspeed and some Mogwai, that put me into the right frame of mind for writing this book. Even now, revisiting this book, I have gone back to that music that I was listening to, perhaps focusing on Godspeed's sibling band, a Silver Mount Zion, who have a more ethereal, less doomy quality about them. Godspeed is more about the upcoming. Is that it? Is that why the Blue Walls is more familiar? Is it the music? I don't recognize the music. I don't recognize any of the instruments. But I understand what I hear as music. I understand it as if it is part of me. It varies in its tone, moving from one slow piece to another aggressive. It's never finished, but always feels complete. Sublime, ecstatic, mournful, pounding, driving, ghostly, drifting. Sound too 
contentious, but I think music is as big an influence as anything else. In many ways, I do feel as if each chapter is like a song in its own right. As if, rather than going for the narrative structure, I was trying to capture the mood of a tune playing in my head, unable to form itself musically, so it came out as expert. pulled away from the music and back to this new place. I shouldn't be here. Nothing in my body, nothing in my soul says I should be here. I don't know how, but it's time to retreat. Let's be me for a while. The door to the room is an exit, but it's not the exit that I need. I search around, looking for second chapter, I am moving into strange territory. I've been aware since the beginning that the way I read any word can have impact on you, the listener. That any inflection or emphasis I make may have been different to how you would have read it on the page. Kind of like seeing the movie before the book and how it affects you. But here, I have totally altered William's voice. To me, it makes sense. It's a dream. He can breathe better. The sickly way all the Trascon sound was designed to reflect breathing in 850 years worth of recycled air. But taking away that voice for this dream? Was it the right choice? When you've always known yourself to speak one way, is it right for in a dream you can hear yourself differently depending on the circumstances? Does that reflect the whole issue of self-identity and how we see ourselves? Well, perhaps then it's time to move to the psychologist's chair. It's funny because I've kind of swapped their roles. Ginger has become all introspective and backward-looking, and it's William who steps into the dream worlds. But what is perhaps most of note is that our new character, Holly, has really started to make an appearance, and she's got... Holly! 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 Holly, 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 and just in case you're wondering, all text was written by me, Daniel's nemesis. An X book is purely a work of fiction and is not meant to be based on anyone or any events at all. The music was also by me, Daniel's nemesis, as was the image for the companies this podcast. It sucks, doesn't it? But there we go. Holly, Holly, Holly.